This famous piece was written in 1843 when Chopin was 33 years old. Like any other waltz, it is a dancing three with a slight emphasis on the first beat of each measure. Before we start this analysis, the first step is to figure out which key this piece is in. The key signature we see here has no sharps or flats, which indicates we can be in either C major or A minor. We call these relative keys since C major and A minor share exactly the same notes. But then how do we know whether this piece is in C major or A minor? In short, we expect to see the tonic chord show up at the beginning and at the end. Here we see the A minor chord doing just that, indicating that this piece is written in the key of A minor, not C major. And the A minor chord is our tonic. The piece is divided in four parts, each developing the main theme with a different harmonic progression which is what we'll look into next. This piece is in the key of A minor, and we start with the A minor chord, or the tonic chord, right in the first measure. Now, how do I know this is an A minor chord? Well, I just put these notes together, E, A, A, C, A, C, and E. Notice that I'm playing the same notes over and over. I just have to group them together, making sure they are now ordered in the order of thirds, where every note is a skip or a third above the other. It just so happens that my left hand is already playing that in the right order. So now I know the first note gives me the name of this triad. This is an A minor triad or an A minor chord. I'll do the same for every other measure in this piece. So again, uh, A minor chord in the first measure. Second, imagine D minor. And notice here that my left hand has A, D, and F, D, D, and F as well. So those three notes are the notes uh, that I have in this chord, but the left hand is not playing those notes on the right order anymore. Uh, these first two notes are not a third apart. So I need to order these notes properly. If I bring the A up, now yes. So now I have a D, skip F, skip a. This means that D is the name of the chord. This is a D minor triad. Moving on to the G7 next. Here I have a G, a B, a D, G, B, F. So if I bring that D down, I see here that I have a G major triad. I also have an F. The F is a third above the triad, is the next third, so the F belongs to this chord. That F is a seventh above the bass G, so we call this a G with a seventh, G7 chord. And notice also that I'm playing other notes on the right hand that don't really belong to this chord. That C doesn't belong, that A doesn't belong either. Those are called melodic notes. We play them all the time. We also have to uh, differentiate when we are trying to figure out which chord we're playing, which notes belong to the chord, which notes are passing notes. So G7, moving on to C major chord. Here I have a C, G, C, and E, bringing the G up. I now have this chord in the right order, C, E, G. Now let's just back up a little bit. We just played the G7 chord. And every major triad with a minor seventh, which is the case here, a G7 is a very special type of chord. We call these dominant chords. Let's take a quick look at dominant chords now. Any major triad with a minor seventh is a dominant chord. In this case, we have a G, a B, and a D as the regular triad, and an F as the next third above the top D. The F forms the seventh above the bass G, hence the name G7 or dominant seventh chord. The important thing about a dominant chord is that it attracts its tonic, and the tonic is always a perfect fifth below it. This attraction is what gives the musical line direction and cohesion. The G7 chord we see here in measure 3 is then attracting the C chord, which is the chord we hear next. Continue in measure 5, we go back to A minor, and then moving on to D minor, again G7, a surprising sequence of chords for a theme that is in the key of A minor. And that's because we didn't hear once the dominant chord of A minor 
designer because remember dominant chords are those chords that we use to attract their tonic and in A minor the dominant chord would be the E the fifth above A so if I play the E major with a seven that creates the attraction that tension that resolves on A minor again and we don't hear this chord not even once in this entire phrase A minor I would expect that that E7 chord, but we don't get that. We actually take a turn, we play a G7, which is the dominant of C, and we finish on C major. And then we play again A minor, D minor, and the same, G7, not the right uh, dominant chord to be. G7, dominant of C, finishing on C major. And the whole thing repeats, A minor, surprising and quite original. In the second section of this piece we finally hear that dominant chord that was missing in the first part, E major with a 7. Here I have an E, I have a B, I have a D, and I also have a G sharp. Putting all of these notes together I see an E major triad plus the minor 7, the D. So this is an E with a 7, an E7 just any seventh chord this is a dominant seventh chord and this is the dominant of its tonic which is a and a is the home key of this piece so now we finally get that dominant tonic dominant tonic going in the second part dominant attracting the tonic that's where we go next part we go back to the main theme in A minor and back again D minor and the same G7 resolve in C major but now the music will take a very interesting turn we hear an A minor again D minor and now a B major with the seventh we have a B major triad with the A that was down here, if I bring that up an octave, I can see that that is part of the sequence of thirds. The A is another third above the top of this chord, and the A is a seventh above the bass. So I say that this is an, a B major chord with a minor seventh, and every major chord with a minor seventh is a dominant. This chord now wants to go to its tonic, it's attracting its tonic, and the tonic of B is the fifth below. E. So when we hear this chord, we want to go to E. The music is leading to E. We do go to E after. We hear the E chord next, but, but, but this E has a D in it. That makes this E a dominant chord as well. So we are now chaining dominance together. And this is a very interesting thing. Let's take a quick look at what's going on here. The attraction between a dominant chord and its tonic creates a real expectation that the chord that follows it should be the tonic. Whenever we hear a dominant chord, we expect its tonic to be the chord that comes after. So for example, a G7 chord creates the expectation that a C chord will follow it. And the same thing happens when we hear an E7 chord, we expect the tonic of E7, the A chord, to come next and also with a D7 chord and the G chord and any other dominant tonic pair. But the next chord doesn't necessarily need to be the expected tonic. We can have some different chord instead. When the next chord is not the tonic, the effect is that of a surprise turn in the harmony, which is exactly what we hear in this moment. 
the B7 chord is a dominant chord and its tonic is the fifth below the E chord. So we expect to hear a simple E triad next. We do arrive on the E, but we arrive on the E chord with a seven, an E major chord with a minor seventh, which makes it another dominant and its tonic is the fifth below the A chord. So we are now chaining dominants together, which is a technique often used to create a moment of harmonic instability. On measure 33, we'll start alternating again dominant, tonic, dominant, tonic, but unlike in the second section where we just came back to the regular tonic, the regular minor chord, here we have an A minor chord. Now here we'll be alternating the same thing, but we actually arrive always on the parallel major key, the A major, not the A minor, the A major. So we hear the dominant seven, back to the main theme in A minor, and then D minor, G7, that dominant seventh chord of C major, arriving in C major, and going back to A minor, D minor, and the same G7, finishing this theme in C major. And by now we've heard this multiple times. But on measure 49, we're about to hear for the first time this main theme in A minor, D minor next. Now with the dominant chord not of C major, but a dominant chord of the home key A minor. And that dominant chord is the E major with the seventh. This E seventh is the dominant of A minor. So this is the chord responsible for attracting the A minor, for bringing our melody back to A minor. So far we heard this main theme always finishing in C. C major at the end always, but now for the first time we hear this uh, finishing in A. We hear that E7, the dominant seventh chord finishing in A minor. And this makes sense because we're about to finish the piece. So Chopin is reaffirming the, the home key of A minor. Then we move on to a short coda. We start the coda with a chord of A minor. This chord in the first inversion, having that C in the bass, not the A, but it's still just an A minor chord. The half diminished chord, arriving on the final cadence with a cadential chord there. Chord A minor with the fifth in the bass. We call this a cadential chord. And at this point, let's take a brief moment to understand better what cadential chords are and why are they so important. A cadence is just a sequence of chords that defines a musical key. It is usually heard at the end of musical phrases and it works like this. Let's imagine we have a phrase in the key of C major. The final few chords of this phrase may form a cadence which is what gives the end of this phrase that sense of finality, that sense of rest. This harmonic sequence can be divided into three parts. First, we can use any chord that belongs to the key we're in, as long as we're not using the dominant just yet. The dominant is the chord that will come next. So in this first step, either one single chord works or a short sequence of chords would also work in the same way. In this example, we are in C major, so a good choice for the first step would be an F major chord or a D minor or even both. The second step will be where we would use a dominant chord, in this case, a G7 chord. And finally, the third step, that will be the tonic chord, in this case, the C major chord. While this formula can be expanded and altered for different effects, you will typically maintain this order except when you use the cadential chord. The cadential chord, often referred to by the letter K, 
is just a tonic chord put in the second inversion with the fifth or the dominant in the bass, and it substitutes the first step. When the cadential chord is used, it always comes in the following order, cadential, dominant seventh, tonic, always before the dominant seventh. If we happen to hear at any point a tonic chord in the second inversion, but that does not come before a dominant chord, that chord cannot be called a cadential chord. That is just a tonic chord in the second inversion. To be called a cadential, it must come right before the dominant chord. And this sequence, cadential, dominant seven, tonic, is exactly what we see at the end of this phrase. We have the cadential, the A minor with the E in the bass. We have the E7, the dominant, and the A minor, the tonic. This sequence, the cadential chord followed by the dominant seventh, maximizes that instability created by the dominant chord because now we have a second chord, the cadential chord, with the dominant note in the bass. We hear two chords next to each other with that dominant note in the bass. So this gives this cadence a lot of weight and it makes this cadence, whenever we use the cadential chord, the strongest and most defining type of cadence in classical harmony. On measure 55, we hear the cadential chord, highlighted by the trill, followed by the dominant seventh chord, the E7, and then finally A minor at the end.